Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to speak in front of the home crowd. I must admit that it uh, induces a little bit more nervousness than I normally feel uh, g giving a, a, a talk. I don't know why that is. But although I am the uh, sole author on this um, talk, I would first like to acknowledge uh, many contributors to the ideas that I'm going to present today, uh, a number of colleagues, um, members of my lab, past and present, and a number of other individuals whose contribution has been um, invaluable. Today, most broadly, I'm, I'm getting feedback. <laughs> yeah, from myself. Um, the, the, this thing. Good. It's actually a decent segue. Decent segue because I'm going to be discussing feedbacks. Uh, uh, so the central theme of this talk is emergence, the emergence of macroscopic pattern from local interactions. And I'm going to be discussing a couple cases of what I view as truly complex adaptive systems that are driven by self-organizing dynamics. And self-assembly and self-organization is pervasive throughout nature, um, from the origami-type uh, folding patterns of proteins, uh, to schooling behavior in fish and flocks of birds, to what I'm going to argue um, ecosystems are prototypical self-organized complex adaptive systems in which the macroscopic patterns that we see, large-scale behavior, take shape as a result of local interactions and local rules. There's no uh, top-down forcing here. There's no blueprint for organizing this. Rather, if individual fish are observing individual fish, interact, and the consequence is this. And I'm going to argue that nutrient cycles are much in the same. And the key here is really understanding the relative strength of exogenous and endogenous forces in shaping these patterns, exogenous forces like um, ongoing global climate change, and to what extent um, the patterns that we see in nature are organized by local interactions um, versus top-down um, influences. And key to understanding these sort of processes is the basic understanding of feedbacks. And today I'm going to be discussing feedbacks in the plant soil system. And we've all seen this. This is a classic circuit um, sort of representation of feedbacks. And uh, we think in nature many processes are regulated and maintained by negative uh, um, feedback, stabilizing feedbacks. And this is basically a, a situation where um, output energy from the amplifying system goes through a feedback network and increases in output energy tend to reduce input energy. A positive feedback is the opposite, where increases in output energy tend to be self-amplifying and increase energy input into the system. Now, if you think about this mathematically, you're multiplying this by this, and the product, if it's one or greater than one, tends to be destabilizing. This is why directional feedbacks tend to be destable. They lead somewhere. And the classic in biology 101 example is pregnancy. Right? OK. So um, I'm going to discuss the influence of plant soil feedbacks. Um, and these are going to consist of uh, two sort of vignettes, if you will, um, two idea-based um, uh, uh, stories. One takes place in the tropics, and one closer to home here. And, um, and so within these, I hope to convince you that the understanding the role of individual species traits and local interactions among them um, help us to understand the emergence of broad scale, um, ecosystem patterns, and how these macroscopic patterns interact with the Earth climate system. OK. The first story. There exist over a trillion canopy trees on Earth. These forests are composed of over 100,000 species. Um, this is a daunting task to understand the role of individual species in terms of how forests work in the broader Earth climate system. And this represents a critical challenge in models and empirical work today. Foresters and plant ecologists have made great strides at the scale of single ecosystems or stand level uh, studies in understanding how individual species traits translate into competition, particularly light-based competition, 
and you can do a pretty good job in a number of forests worldwide with predicting stand level production and species composition. It's really amazing how far this has come. This does not, this is not the case in uh, global land models. So one of the most exciting things to emerge in the last 20 years in terms of how we understand forests and the earth climate system is development of these dynamic global vegetation models. But as illustrated here by Friedlingstein, um, there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty with how uh, the land carbon sink works, particularly as we move into the future um, with um, increasing uh, temperatures and rainfall variability, et cetera. But we now think that a large part of this uncertainty here actually has to do with a lack of realistic parameterization of dynamics in forests. The species by species, individual by individual um, interactions. We don't really capture with the big leaf model. Some of these interactions that are most critical are nutrient cycles and nutrient limitation. That organisms need resources to grow. If they don't have them, they die and can't reproduce. They are fundamental to understanding how forests work. Today I'm going to be focusing on nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. So there's a lot of trees out there. Um, there, it's not um, adequately, understanding of them is not adequately implemented into process-based models. This task is most daunting in the tropics. It harbors a tremendous, stunning level of canopy diversity. We can have hundreds of species per hectare. Okay. And back to feedbacks, one of the dominant ideas with what maintains diversity in these forests are a series of negative jansen connell type feedbacks. And jansen connell type feedbacks, an example of this would be named after Dan Jansen and, and Joe Connell, um, who had the seminal idea here that, that around individual species, individual trees and forests, it could be any sort of uh, ecosystem actually, um, you tend to develop, you accumulate host-specific enemies. But there could be a variety of other mechanisms. That is, if you drop a propagule, um, a seed, you have a lower probability of surviving if it falls close to you because you've developed all these specific enemies in, um, in the tropics in particular that want to kill you. And you have a higher probability of surviving the further away you are. So there's some beautiful um, uh, studies emerging here. The study by Mangan et al. in the Barro, Colorado forest in Panama where they actually did this through really rigorous experimentation in greenhouses and demonstrated that they, you could generate some of these local diversity patterns through these negative plant soil feedbacks. A particularly vexing problem that's exist in understanding the role of the, what maintains diversity and its role in the Earth climate system is the existence of tropical monodominant forests. And this is what I'm going to focus on in the first half here. And these have been described uh, since the time of Joe Connell and others. And monodominant, classical monodominance is defined as a forest in which one species dominates greater than 60% of the canopy. Now this is intriguing because the very idea is uh, by definition incongruous with the mechanisms that we think on maintain high diversity in forests. Why does this not occur in these forests as well? In these forests can be quite old. So they've really fascinated ecologists for a number of years and there's been a variety of hypotheses put forth to explain them. Uh, there's a number of examples of these around the world. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on today is Mora excelsa. This one has received a lot of attention. Uh, many areas of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, are dominated by Dipterocarpaceae. Um, so this is a broadly distributed um, phenomena, but they occupy a relatively small part of the landscape in most cases. And so they provide, I'm going to argue, a really good window into understanding the mechanisms of, of trait-based biogeochemistry and how these big patterns at the scale of ecosystems emerge by local interactions. Okay. There are a variety of positive feedbacks have been invoked to explain the maintenance of monodominance worldwide. And you can um, follow any one of these around. Um, I'm going to be focusing on low nutrient availability today, but the idea, for example, one is a lot, lot of these involve low rates of exogenous disturbance. So under 
uh, low frequency disturbance environments, um, you are able to develop canopy dominance. This should favor species that have high shade tolerance and, and have large seeds that are able to do um, well in deep litter like this that is derived from slow decomposition, which leads to low nutrient availability and around and around. Now, keep in mind what I just said about the very nature of positive feedbacks. And this has not been adequately or rigorously evaluated. Um, and that is, how long can this last? This phenomenon, which seems to be quite common um, around the world, but by no means geographically dominant, by its very nature seems like an unstable system. And so um, this I find quite intriguing, and I would just like to emphasize that that's sort of where I'm going uh, with this. And for those of you who think about nutrient cycles and plant soil systems, this should look familiar. And so here's a classic sort of representation by Chapin of Batusik's work on Hawaii. And here um, you, could, you have a given species, this is for Miracophea, I think, a nitrogen fixer. And you have rich environments and, that are rich in phosphorus and areas that are poor in phosphorus. The idea of, is that when you have low phosphorus, this could be nitrogen as well, and have low tissue phosphorus concentrations, which leads to low litter in its turnover, low litter uh, nutrient concentrations, which should drive slower decomposition, slow regeneration, et cetera, around and around. Now, it is questionable whether this represents a, an equilibrium view of, of terrestrial nature or not. Um, but there's clearly evidence for there, this existing within certain points in time and space. Now, could this be driving or actually a contributor to the to the maintenance of these monodominant forests tropically? Well, one thing is that it stands in stark contrast to what we now know as a very general and global pattern with nitrogen richness in unpolluted tropical forests. So our past work has demonstrated that, on average, uh, undisturbed, diverse tropical forests tend to accumulate, recycle, and export a tremendous amount of bioavailable nitrogen at levels that we observe only in polluted temperate forests, areas exposed to chronic nitrogen deposition, for example. We can actually analytically demonstrate this quite simply that it is impossible for this to occur if you assume nitrogen limitation. So all else being equal in this model, what, what I did is I said, let's uh, be fair and say that both temperate and tropical forests globally are nitrogen limited. Can we explain this pattern of high nitrogen leakiness in tropical forests, assuming climate sensitivity of certain parts of the nitrogen cycle? The answer is no. And the conclusion is that many tropical forests worldwide seem to exist in a state of nitrogen saturation. This doesn't mean that there aren't parts of the ecosystem, microsites, certain areas generated by heterogeneity that are nitrogen limited. But in general, at the scale of ecosystems, it doesn't appear to be the case. We can demonstrate that this is a sustained pattern through time. So here um, we studied one of the longest records for old growth tropical forests globally and find that nitrate losses over the last 20 years or so, a period of pronounced global change, um, are stable. And this is further supported by stability in the isotopic composition of nitrate. The 15N signature of nitrate should be highly sensitive to ecologically realistic perturbations to the plant soil system, we don't see this. So this is an internally generated pattern. These are unpolluted forest. These, for whatever reason, um, they seem to generate, accumulate, and export a lot of nitrogen. There's a variety of reasons uh, that, that we think this occurs. And one of them is um, high rates of biological nitrogen fixation. Now, if we are discussing symbiotic biological nitrogen fixation, which we're all familiar with. Uh, if we have peas in our garden, uh, bacteria, rhizobia, associate with legumes. And there's a variety of other nitrogen fixing symbiosis worldwide. The problem with this, as we've termed the nitrogen paradox, is that economically, from the point of view of a plant, uh, nitrogen fixation is very expensive. 16 ATPs, tremendous amount of carbon. You shouldn't fix ecologically or evolution evolutionarily if there's already a bunch of nitrogen around. And so we've, we think that there's a lot of facultative nitrogen fixation going on in these forests. 
and um, and that there is a variety of mechanisms, including uh, heterogeneity and asymbiotic fixation, which give rise to nitrogen uh, richness in these forests. This is not the focus of the talk, but I wanted to present this as context to contrast against this phenomena of monodominance. Okay, let's look at these monodominant species, and I apologize if that's too small, but these are all the ones that have been uh, uh, described, defined uh, globally, and uh, and uh, accompanied by a list of traits that have been argued to um, generate or sustain this pattern. Ectomycorrhizae is one, uh, masting, poor dispersal, etc. It turns out that the majority of these species worldwide are legumes. So this should be interesting all the way, given the discussion we just had about nitrogen fixation, its role in the generation of nitrogen richness in the tropics. These are all legumes, and they all belong to the subfamily Cisalpinioidae. So what's interesting about this? Cisalpinioids are old. They uh, evolved around 60 million years ago. They're a phylogenetically very diverse group. OK, so that's cool. So they're a nodal group that is actually uh, seems somewhat basal. This is actually a, phylog a molecular analysis done by our own Matt Lavin um, here. Well, what's even more intriguing is that nitrogen fixation is rare to non-existent in cisalpinoidae. So is it a coincidence that the majority of monodominant species worldwide also belong to an evolutionary group in which fixation doesn't occur? I don't think so. So this here illustrates the, the sort of evolutionary perspective of how complex adaptive systems work. Um, you, there's lots of biogeochemistry. There's the bread and butter of what we measure is accounting, input and output. But here um, is, is, is a possibility that we can understand how these things um, evolve as systems by looking at its component parts. OK, so here's the salpinoidae. They really don't form symbiotic um, uh, associations with bacteria. So again, back to these positive feedbacks. Uh, I'm going to focus on low nutrient availability um, right here. Now, I should step back for a second. And uh, for those of you who um, are uh, actively um, interested in biodiversity function, uh, arguments, uh, which I'm not going to go into in detail today. This idea of these positive trait-based feedbacks generating low nutrient availability and the drawdown um, and actually the sort of self-amplification of low fertility stands in contrast to what we um, uh, think about in terms of uh, increasing species richness and the theoretical expectations of, of of work mostly in grasslands, like the classic work by Tillman, where as you increase the number of species, you see a drawdown of nitrate, a uh, highly plant available form of nitrogen, as you increase the number of species and you simultaneously increase production, and in this case, cover. Well, diverse tropical forests are way beyond this axis, and I've just demonstrated that they tend to be very rich in nitrogen. So these are very different systems. I'm not saying this is wrong in any way. This is a beautifully designed and carefully executed analysis. But it's, a, it's different. Um, it's questionable to what degree this actually represents self-assembly. They're not, by definition. They planted these species. Okay. Um, again, we're focusing on more excelsa. More excelsa turns out to be the first described case of monodominance worldwide by this intrepid ecologist J.S. Beard, um, who was at the time working for the Colonial Forest Service. And this guy literally walked every square kilometer of Trinidad. And he was particularly fascinated with these uh, organisms, the Mora excelsa, and he termed them gregarious. And he um, was just fascinated as to what could generate this. He had spent years tromping around through highly diverse forests. And is particularly interesting because there didn't seem to be any really distinct geomorphic, edaphic breaks between monodominant and diverse forest. The environment looked the same. So this has been a classic sort of argument in the monodominant literature is, uh, well, can environment explain it? Environment doesn't explain it. Is it plant soil feedbacks? I think it's all the above. Um, and one size doesn't fit all. 
one explanation for a monodominant case somewhere may not work for another. But of course, here today we're looking for generality. And I do think that the nutrient cycling uh, uh, results here can, might well be general to this and have implications for diversity. Here's Trinidad. Uh, we've been working in the Northern Range for the last, uh, with my colleague Steve Thomas, the University of Nebraska in the Northern Range here for the last five years. There's been a lot of land use in uh, Trinidad, but up here there's, there's actually quite a bit of mature and old growth forest left where we're working in the Peria River Basin, which drains right out into the Caribbean. Uh, these forests have never been logged. Trinidad is also out of the hurricane path, so we're not really concerned about frequent disturbance. It's only 15 kilometers north of Venezuela. So we're actually looking at a very diverse assemblage of, of trees here. This is an Amazonian type forest. In fact, historically, uh, when, old nat when naturalists were describing the Amazonian flora, many of these studies actually took place in Trinidad. They hadn't, they, they, they hadn't actually started venturing down into the Amazon basin. Okay, uh, here's a picture of a diverse forest, just a couple illustrations here. Um, and, Here's a Mora excelsa. They have a variety of traits which could confer dominance and exploitative competition. They're the tallest kids on the block. They develop their own canopy, um, about 40 meters tall, and basically shade out others. They constitute 80% of the canopy of these forests. These forests are hundreds of years old. So if you're thinking uh, recent disturbance and, and invasion, that may be, uh, invasion may be happening, but you need to stretch out the temporal domain. This, these, these things are, walking into these is like walking into a cathedral redwood forest. They also have these huge buttresses. And this is not an uncommon site. Tremendous shade tolerance of their seedlings. Um, sometimes you can w walk through these areas and the only thing you see is Mora excelsa. And for those of you who have walked around in a diverse tropical forest, you know how weird this is. I mean, this is not just in a disturbance patch where one species is taking over. This is all over. They have dense uh, litter accumulation that is populated by um, tons of roots, surface roots. They form their own organic horizon. And these are covered with these nodules of unknown function. They're not uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, they're not ectomycorrhizal. They are arbuscular. Uh, 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 mycorrhizal, uh, vesicular mycorrhizal, but uh, as far as we know, there's no ectomycorrhizal association. That's what other people have found. My colleague Nina has done a whole bunch of staining and dissections of these things, and she doesn't know what these things are doing. So we, we, have, we have a long way to go in terms of investigating the mechanisms, um, but it's curious. Okay, so we took a small watershed approach, and over five years and uh, a number of basin scale campaigns, we analyzed um, atmospheric inputs, uh, chemistry in nitrogen deposition and rainfall, outputs in stream water, a variety of soil characteristics, and these are diverse forests, and these are the Mora excelsa forests. In fact, from this Google image, you can see from space, I don't know if you can see this from this angle, you can actually see the canopy. It's quite visible, uh, uh, this, this lighter green here. Anyway. Our sampling strategy spanned uh, five years and encompassed the most severe drought on record and, and a very long wet season. So I think we captured a lot of the um, inherent hydrologic variability and um, a lot of um, the spatial variation in the landscape. So our central question here is, is the nitrogen cycle in these Mora excelsa forests, a non-fixing sesalpinoid, that is able to dominate locally for hundreds and hundreds of years, qualitatively and quantitatively different from its diverse neighbors that we have much more information about, and I've already characterized in one way, they tend to have a lot of nitrogen and don't seem to be limited by nitrogen. Rather, they're limited by something else. Okay. So, um, first results. We, um, to assess whether um, the mora, any patterns that we saw emerge in the nitrogen cycle could be due to exogenous factors or actually generated by the internal plant soil system itself. 
uh, we looked at uh, patterns uh, of organic matter cycling here, indicated by stacked measures of carbon, del 13C, percent nitrogen, and del 15N. And across all these, except for the nitrogen isotopes, there was no difference, indicating similarities in the long-term organic matter storage in these forests. Now, that's important because if the, there were huge differences in these, these are quite stable features uh, of soils, uh, we would have to question, is this a disturbance signal that we're looking at here? Is there just something going on? These, have these come in like weeds? And, and that would still be interesting. Uh, but that doesn't appear the case. With the DEL-15N signature, there appears to be a difference, and there's a slightly significant relationship here. This, among other things, is a good indicator of how much nitrogen is recirculating through the system. Higher nitrogen availability often confers more enriched um, uh, soil organic matter, isotopically enriched soil organic matter. This is because microbes discriminate against heavy um, 15 in, uh, preferring to use 14 in, and leave behind the heavy stuff. So when you have more stuff burning through the system, you often see uh, an enriched signal in 15 in. So this is very intriguing, and this suggests that there is more plant-available nitrogen circulating through the system of diverse forests than more forests. Well, this is precisely what we found. If we um, examine uh, the vertical distribution of nutrients in the rooting zone of focal trees um, in mora in diverse forests, we see that <clears throat> diverse forests have three times as much ammonium in the rooting zone of the forest. Same goes for nitrate, and this seems to be associated with a difference in root biomass. This would suggest that mora through its complex network of, of surface rooting, is acting to draw down plant-available nitrogen and is organizing a very conservative nitrogen cycle compared to its diverse counterparts. If we then jump to mineral soils, which integrate stuff happening in the higher horizons of soils and, um, and the transport processes eventually leading to hydrologic exports, <clears throat> This is during the dry season. We see that nitrate is five to ten times higher in the mineral soils of diverse forests compared to mora forests. These values right here are very similar to what we observe in nitrogen-rich diverse tropical forests worldwide. Whereas these values, these are the values you see in unpolluted old-growth temperate forests in Oregon and Chile and Argentina. In, mo in many cases, they were undetectable, right near detection. Very low nitrate, and this translates into high nitrate to ammonium ratios over years in these mineral soils. Now, why is this important? Nitrate, is, in addition to being highly bioavailable, is also highly mobile. So this pattern, this persistent pattern, would predict uh, lower mineral nitrogen losses from the plant soil system in mora forests. So here is, we are now going to examine if what we think is a pattern deriving from the very local interactions of, of, of plants, the roots, and nutrient cycles emerges into an ecosystem scale pattern, which is hydrologic losses at the watershed scale. So um, before we do that, uh, if, if we then look at those same mineral soils we we're addressing here, and then we ask how stable are these patterns over time, we can do this by looking at ammonium nitrate and nitrate to ammonium ratios as a function of dry to wet season. Okay, so we sampled across very dry, uh, dry seasons and very wet, wet seasons, and what we find consistently is that mora does not change at all, no significant change. Now it needs nitrogen like everything else. This is not acting con conservatively. It is doing this itself. Look at how dynamic diverse forests are increasing six-fold during the dry season uh, compared to the wet season. So if there was no change over time, this ratio would be one for all of these. And this is what we see with mora consistently, resulting in nitrate to change in nitrate to ammonium ratios in diverse forest soils that increase up to, that are a hundred-fold different. Okay, so how does this translate into hydrologic losses? Like this. We find that over all this 
sites that we studied and over the five years that hydrologic losses from diverse forests were on average two times higher than from mora forests. And you could see that diverse forests occupy a broader topographic range than mora forests. And so we asked, well, are there things about higher elevations or steeper slopes that could result in this pattern that doesn't have anything to do with what organisms are doing? It's a fair question. So we assessed that, and the answer is no. Um, this is, uh, we asked if there is patterns. So this, let me get back here. This could be created by differential dilution, right? So if there's more water or less evaporation in the Mora forest for some reason, um, then you could get this pattern just by conservative mixing, assuming that they were doing the same thing. But we already know they're not because I just showed you all that soil information. Okay, so the ions that should trace the hydrologic cycle and weathering don't differ um, over time. I'm going to rush through a little bit these because I realize how little time I have. And so we also uh, assessed uh, potential differences in evaporation across these watersheds by looking at deuterium excess. We can trace local evaporation and water vapor sources. And this is basically where you compare deuterium and O18 against a reference uh, meteoric water line. And we find that there is no change across elevations, no differences uh, between the watersheds, and there's no change through time. OK, how about through time? How do nitrate losses um, differ between the forest types? Well, they differ dramatically. Um, and we find that losses from the Mora forests are very stable in response to a severe drought driest dry season on record, followed by extremely long wet season. They change only subtly, about 40%, whereas you see this huge rocketing of nitrate uh, from diverse forests. This is indicative of nitrogen-rich conditions. You don't see increasing nitrate concentrations in leachate as a function of increasing flow unless you have a lot of nitrogen. It, in, it invokes an inexhaustible reservoir or high nitrogen production that keeps up with the demand. In this case, the demand sink is water, gravity, pushing it away. If you're nitrogen limited and you have a little bit, only a little bit of nitrogen to spare, you should see a dilution response. Instead, we see a huge increase in concentrations. Very stable in the, in the Mora forest. And this is, of course, deriving, locally derived from the patterns that we see in the plant soil system. Okay. Now, we used uh, basin scale estimates of water fluxes in these um, systems to estimate everything I presented was concentrations, uh, and the actual fluxes show the same thing. OK. Uh, now, we then asked, well, perhaps that there's a different kind of loss, a vector uh, from Mora forests that are compensating, balancing. The actual nitrogen inputs and losses are the same between these forests. What we're just looking at is a difference in the internal cycle. The two things that can do this are dissolved organic nitrogen losses, which can actually maintain nitrogen limitation over long, long periods of time, or gas losses, which can also constrain the nitrogen cycle in some cases. We ignore fire or volatilization because they're old growth and they have acid soils. DON, while higher in Mora forests, um, significantly higher, which is quite interesting, cannot balance the, the, the nitrogen losses. It's only a little bit higher compared to the huge amounts of inorganic nitrogen that are pouring out of the diverse forest. But we do see an elevated signature of 15N nitrate in diverse forest compared to Mora forest. Not only that, but we see this nice linear relationship between nitrate concentrations and 15N nitrate, which is what you theoretically would predict from a denitrifying system. So here we have evidence suggestive evidence that denitrification is also higher in diverse forests compared to Mora forests. And this makes sense. You need nitrate substrate to denitrify. You don't have it in the Mora forest. You have significantly less. So uh, we use an isotope mass balance model that I'm not going to go into right now to actually constrain our gas losses. And again, we find that if we add hydrologic losses plus gas losses, they're twice to four times as high as we see from Mora forests. And we can compare this to our long-term measures of nitrogen and atmospheric deposition. And we conclude that in diverse forests, it is quite possible that mineral losses exceed inputs, whereas this is very unlikely in the Mora forests. 
Now you can prove mathematically that if you have high, higher losses of bioavailable nitrogen than you are receiving from atmospheric deposition, there's no way you can be nitrogen limited. It's just impossible. And so this suggests that these diverse forests, like many other diverse forests, are existing in a state of nitrogen saturation. The mora forests are not. They seem to be have the characteristics of maintaining nitrogen limitation, and it derives from a control of nitrate in the soils. OK, so are we seeing something like this in the mora forest? Maybe. And it would, might go something like this. Um, long nitrogen residence time, high nitrogen efficiency. There's published data um, on these things, uh, leading to slow mineralization. But again, these positive feedbacks at equilibrium would be really hard to maintain. And if you have lower nitrogen losses overall, this means, this requires that you have lower nitrogen inputs into the system over time. has to. Now, the internal nitrate production, we don't know what's going on there. We suspect it's either plant preference, inhibition of nitrification, or dissimilatory reduction of ammonium, uh, of nitrate to ammonium. But at the ecosystem level, this points to the idea that if these differences are sustained, there has to be a difference in input. It is quite possible that despite lower nitrogen availability in the mora forest, they actively exclude potentially symbiotic fixers. Um, and this is very intriguing. Again, remembering the evolutionary history of cisalpinoids, do these represent a critical state in the nitrogen cycle that is inherently unstable over millennial time frames, but you see them flashing on and flashing off as an alternative nitrogen cycling strategy globally? <laughs> OK, let's switch gears really quickly and go locally here. Uh, addressing um, the feedbacks once again in the plant soil system, now I'm going to uh, provide uh, a case study in which I think compensatory dynamics are going on, in which um, the emergent uh, uh, pattern, this, in this case ecosystem productivity, is relatively constant across tree, uh, systems receiving radically different amounts of snow and how that occurs. So uh, the study then takes us to these subalpine grasslands, which are a very common feature of the northern Rockies, and in fact, um, high elevations globally. And um, um, me and, and my lab happen to be fortunate to um, work with our colleague Tad Weaver, I'm an ecologist um, in the ecology department, who has been studying production and species composition in subalpine meadows locally here, 30 kilometers away in the bank tails, for over 40 years. He, in 1968, established a snow manipulation experiment in which um, experimental treatments, either are controls, receive two times as much snow or four times as much snow. This site happens to be uh, an original international biological program site, uh, for those of you familiar with this. So it's a well-described site, and Tad has um, diligently collected um, um, some of the data that I'm going to show you with his ecology class for the last 40 years. And it, ha it turns out to be the longest snow manipulation exper experiment that I know of globally. So I think we're all fortunate to benefit from what Tad has done here. Um, this is uh, pictures of the site here, pictures during um, spring. Here's the big pattern that's motivating a lot of this. Over the last four decades, we see a precipitous decline in above ground biomass in these native grasslands, irrespective of treatments that add two times and four times the amount of snow, dramatically contract the growing season length, change the amount of water and nutrients available in the system. And so, we are currently investigating, and this is not the subject of this talk, describing the secular pattern, but we're currently investigating the mechanisms behind this. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to right now is that if you look across these treatments, the mean field biomass is not that different across these treatments that differ dramatically in the amount of snow they are receiving. Okay, so that's very intriguing. Four times as much water, dramatic reduction in growing season length, and you still, at the end of the day, have the same amount of biomass in, in the above-ground ecosystem compartments. 
So we're investigating a variety of mechanisms here. We know that the long-term snow manipulation has dramatically changed resource availability in the soils, here indicated by phosphorus and nitrogen with depth. There's also been a huge turnover in species composition and functional groups. Now, these are all native species, um, but what we find emerging in the uh, two and four times snow treatment is a completely novel ecosystem. Native species, but in assemblages that you don't see anywhere else. Uh, maybe these assemblages existed in a former time with more snow. Uh, but uh, here you can see that uh, forbs, as usual, have more nitrogen and phosphorus than their grass neighbors. But what we see has happened in the treatments here in control two times, four times snow is a dramatic shift in the forb to grass ratio. More forb rich, the more snow you add. And yet we're still seeing the same production at the end of the growing season. So um, this is a conceptual diagram that uh, Yuriko Iano came up with. And we're basically investigating a variety of these factors in these ecosystems and what the role of long-term snow manipulation is. Uh, um, and that hopefully we can use these by measuring everything we can possibly imagine to parameterize process-based models that can help us understand how nutrient cycles and production are working at the scale of ecosystems. How are we doing this? Well, one way is some very exciting work that my student Jordan Halsinger is working on. He's actually asking, can we understand individual plant-based functions, trait-based functions, and do these scale up to what we see at the level of ecosystems? So here he's, I'm, I'm showing one of his model plants, Bromus marginatus, a native grass here, and leaf level measures of photosynthesis transpiration and uh, relative to soil moisture. So here's another thing that regardless of the massive differences in snow on these experimental treatments, by the time we actually get out and start measuring this, the soil moisture is the same. How does that happen? Well, one way it could happen is there, there is a limited uh, moisture holding capacity in the soils. And the water just blows through. This has to have huge implications for exports. And we're investigating that as well. Here's where uh, Jordan's also studying things like nitrogen cycling rates and mineralization availability over the growing season and how this matches with plant use. So one intriguing thing that I've been interested in for a long time and uh, what we're hoping to tackle with process-based modeling is in a nutrient-limited system, you should expect plants to beat gravity, much as I showed with the Mora excelsa. But the timing of that can be very important, especially under snowpack. If you're mineralizing nutrients and water wakes up before plants do. Um, and here, uniquely, we have the opportunity to address that in a very rigorous fashion. Uh, so Jordan's doing this with a whole bunch of species. We're also um, measuring things at the ecosystem level. Uh, Yuriko is leading these efforts to understand um, uh, biogeochemistry uh, in snow and um, leaching losses in, in lysimeters. And some of the preliminary data are very exciting. It's a work in progress here, but uh, uh, some of the preliminary work shows a significant amount of ammonium in um, inputs in snow here. And this is actually common to the northern Rockies. Uh, nitrate deposition is in decreasing throughout the northern Rockies. Ammonium is increasing. That's gross, because ammonium, you know, it derives from agriculture and livestock. Clean air, you should not see ammonium. Nitrogen deposition in Montana is very low. By all intents and purposes, all the ecosystems around here are unpolluted from a nitrogen deposition perspective. But ammonium's increasing, and we're investigating that, as well as phosphorus deposition, and looking at the losses here. Okay, the work in progress. Um, so, I think I need to... Wrap up here. Um, leave you with one recent hypothesis for what's going on in terms of the no change in biomass, not through time, but across the treatments, despite a radical change in resource availability, growing season length, and species composition, is that different plants are getting to the same place in different ways. Uh, as you can tell by the sophisticated graph here, that the species in the high snow treatments are larger and taller, and there's more open space among them. The native fescue grassland, 
denter with smaller individuals. This is a very intriguing self-sorting mechanism that may rely on negative feedbacks in the plant soil system. We're pursuing this. Okay, so I've tried to present uh, a, a few a couple examples of how plant soil feedbacks can lead to macroscopic properties that we emerge at the scale of ecosystems. And I do think that many of these processes are fundamental to understanding how these ecosystems interact with the global climate system. And I will take any questions. <laughs>